But something else about the second coming, if you, you can collect a dozen passages, over a dozen passages, that talk about the second coming uh, as a very dramatic uh, event, obviously. You can also f collect a group of passages that describe the rapture in very different terms. And I don't have the time to go through each one of these. I'm going to categorize them in a different way. There, these two groups of passages are contradictory. The group of passages that talk about the rapture I'll put in one bucket, the others, the second coming, another, and I'll call the different sessions. In the one case you have the translation of belie you know, believers only. In the second coming of Christ there is no translation mentioned. The translation occurs before at the rapture or at the end of the thousand years. There's two different things. In the rapture the translated saints go to heaven. In the second coming the translated saints return to the earth. There's a difference. They're opposites in fact. In the rapture the earth isn't judged. In the second coming that's the whole purpose of it. It is judged. The rapture is described as being eminent. That is it could happen at any moment. Jesus clearly instructs us to expect Him at any time. The second coming is quite different. It follows after seven years of details that precede the second coming. The rapture is not in the Old Testament. I think it's hinted in a couple of places, but it's not formally there. It's certainly uh, the second coming is predicted all through the Old Testament. The rapture is believers only. The second coming affects all men on the planet Earth. The rapture occurs before the day of wrath. The second coming concludes the day of wrath. This rapture has no reference to Satan. The second coming, Satan's bound. In the rapture, Jesus comes for his own. In the second coming, he comes with his own. He comes in the air in the one case. He comes to the earth in the other. He claims his bride in the rapture. He comes with his bride in the second coming. In the rapture, only his own shall see him. Do you realize that with, when, from the crucifixion on, he was only seen by loving eyes and only handled by loving hands. Interesting. And even in the rapture, only his own will see him. In the second coming, every eye shall see him. Rapture, the tribulation begins, or shortly thereafter, and the second coming is when the millennium begins, not the tribulation. Rapture is the church only. The second coming, there are many scholars who believe the Old Testament saved are raised after the millennium. So let's get back to this eschatology. What we've, now we've got this tribulation issue. Among those of us that are premillennial, there are three groups of variations here. And uh, there are those that believe, as I've emphasized here, that the rapture occurs before the tribulation begins. We'd call, we would call those pre-tribulational. There are others that believe that the, the, the uh, rapture occurs at the end of the seven year, seventh week of Daniel, and they're post-tribulational. We'll talk about the ones in the middle. In Matthew 24, verse 21, Jesus is responding to a private briefing to four disciples about a second coming. When he gets to verse 21, he says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was, since, was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Um, this is, Jesus here in effect, is quoting from Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. He is labeling this period as the Great Tribulation. He gives it that very label. And uh, so, the, uh, this, uh, the, 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 great, the, the Holocaust in Germany took one Jew out of three on the planet, in the planet Earth. Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9 indicates that this next one will take two out of three. And uh, that's a very disturbing revelation. I didn't say that. Zechariah did. Chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. Great Tribulation. It gets its label from Christ's quote here. He's quoting from Daniel 12. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such was never, as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that, sh everyone that shall be found uh, written in the book. And uh, in the, the, another label for this period of time is the time of Jacob's trouble. Because the focus of the Great Tribulation is worldwide, but it's on Israel. It's focusing on Israel. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. So we have this famed seven week that we studied so much in Daniel. The la and it's punctuated in the middle by this peculiar event called the abomination of desolation. Paul's second letter to Thessalonians talks about him 
setting himself up in, 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 as God in the, in the Holy of Holies. From that event to the end of the seven-year period, a three-and-a-half-year period is the Great Tribulation. I want to call your attention to the fact the Great Tribulation is not seven years long, it's three-and-a-half. People tend to use the term the Great Tribulation for the whole week. Technically, Jesus himself defines it as the last half of that week. Not a big deal, but be sensitive to the precision here. If you're going to be serious about the Bible, watch the definitions. The second coming concludes that 70th week and sets up, of course, the millennium. So far, so good. The big debate comes, okay, where does the rapture take place? People who are amillennial in the first place generally assume that the rapture or the, the, the resurrection, if you'll call it, they wouldn't call it the rapture part, but the resurrection occurs at the end of that 70th week. That's called post-tribulationalism. And there's all different kinds. Even the authors that hold those views all have different views. There's no, there isn't a single consistent view. They all have different variations because they're all dealing with allegorization of the Scripture in the first place. There's some problems with the post-trib view. It denies the teaching of eminency. If the uh, rapture doesn't occur until the end of the seven years, it can't happen tomorrow. Donald Gray Barnhouse used to kid his students when he came in the office. He said, sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come back today meaning that if you're post-tribulation, you've got to wait seven years at least, maybe more. No, the t the, clearly we're taught to expect them at any time. The post-tribulation view also requires the church to be on the earth during the 70th week, which also is con contradicted by a number of passages. The, also, the, the post-tribulation view uh, argues that the church will experience God's wrath, even though we were promised that it would not participate in several passages. And the other thing, how can the bride come with him if he's coming at the end of it. See, you get some contradictions. There are other problems. You get into problems, who's going to populate the millennium because the unsaved are condemned and the ones that are saved are immortal and who's populating the millennium that's going to have kids and die and so on. So there's some issues there. And where, who are the sheep and goat judgment of Matthew 25 is an issue. And how can the virgins of Matthew 25 buy oil without the mark of the beast? And you get into some, you just discover this, if you, were take, you, you, you can't hold that view and take the Bible with precision, you end up having to allegorize these things. So uh, that's the one view. The view that we lean towards, obviously, is called pre-tribulational premillennialism. We believe a literal millennium, of course, but we also believe that the rapture will occur before the tribulation. Uh, but what we mean by that, we actually believe it's not only is it before the tribulation, it's before the seventh week even begins. I want you to notice, now there are, oh, there are some people that recognize the tribulation is technically just that last half of the week. So they believe they'll be raptured by the middle of the week, still before the tribulation, but in the middle of the seventh week of Daniel. And uh, Rosenthal, pre, so-called pre-wrath, there's a number of positions that are variations of that. They all have the same problem. They all deny eminency. Anything that requires you to be in or any part of that week means it can't happen tomorrow. And yet we're told again and again the doctrine of eminency it, it implies that Jesus can come for us at any moment. And that's clearly what he taught us. And so all these other views are contra contradict that issue. But I want you to know something else. We don't put our little arrow up at the beginning of the 70th week. Some people make charts a little sloppily. We don't know what the interval of time is between the time the rapture takes place and the time that the Antichrist gets revealed, becomes powerful enough to enforce a treaty, and then enforces a treaty with Israel for seven years. That could be one day. It could be 30 years. We have no idea. So there's an interval. I don't know how long. It might be measured in hours or months or years between the rapture and the beginning of the seventh week of Daniel. It probably isn't long for lots of reasons, but there is an interval as, as we see it. So the rapture precedes the tribulation because the seventh week is defined by the covenant enforced by the leader. The great tribulation lasts half of that week. The leader cannot be revealed until after the rapture. So that's, that's, that's the buildup of that timing, if you will. If you really... Verify this for yourself in your studies. It will clear, clarify, a, lift a great deal of confusion that tends to occupy this area of study. Again, the order of events. The day of the Lord can't come until the apostasia, whatever that is, which in turn, then the restrainer is removed in any case. And the man of sin is revealed, which is all before the seventh week of Daniel. You with me? Therefore, before the tribulation. Okay, so we've talked about those, the different portions of, of eschatology. We've talked about the pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. People who have, uh, the, the amillennial post-trib co accommodates most denominations have inherited that from the medieval church originally. 
Most of us that are fundamentalists, take the Bible very literally, fall on the other end. Uh, we're t- pr- typically premillennial, pre-tribulational in our, in our viewpoints. There, therein lies the, 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 the map, if you will, of, of eschatological views. From allegorical to literal, depends what your hermeneutics are. Now many people say pre-tribulation is a, a new invention. That's not true. It's written in the Epistle of Barnabas in the first century, Irenaeus in, in his a treatise against heresies, Hippolytus in the second century, Justin Martyr, the early church fathers. One of the most interesting documents was just discovered a few years ago by Ephraim the Syrian. Most of us inherit our understanding of the church history from the Western church, Western Europe. You need to remember that the Eastern tradition goes deeper and longer by a thousand years, the, the, Greek, uh, the, uh, the, the Greek traditions. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the most prolific writers in the Greek tradition was a guy by the name of Ephraim the Syrian, wrote in the fourth century. And uh, he wrote one of his, one, most of his stuff has never been translated from Greek to English. In one of his sermons, the title of which was on the last times, the Antichrist and the end of the world, in one of the sermons, he, this is, we're talking guy now, for, this is fourth century. It says, For all the saints and the elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. This is a pre-trib position taught uh, way back in the early Greek church. Uh, we also, you can go all through the ancient uh, commentaries. This is not a new idea. There are people opposed to this view that try to promote the idea it was invented in the early 1800s. That's not true. What did happen in the 1800s, a guy by the name of Emmanuel Lacunza uh, popularized this. A guy by the name of Edward Irving and John Darby and Margaret MacDonald followed suit. And they were, there was a, a big revival and an emphasis on this view. But you'll actually, if you do your homework in terms of church history, you'll discover these views were held by a minority from the beginning all through history. They're the ones that are typically abused by the denominational interests, whether they're Catholic or Protestant. But something else, standing away from all this, you realize there are three groups of people facing the judgment called the Flood of Noah. Those that perished in the Flood, of course, is one group. Those that were preserved through the Flood, the eight people on that ark. And there's a third group, those that were removed prior to the Flood, Enoch, remember? And you say, well, Chuck, that's just one person. So is the body of Christ one person. Paul emphasized that we are one body and so forth. So idiomatically, at least, we are one. So I'm, I'm very fascinated by this. Um, because I want to suggest to you that Enoch was not mid-flood or post-flood. He was pre-flood. Okay. <laughs> okay. But what's interesting, I've stumbled on something that fascinates me. In the, among the rabbinical traditions, they believe that Enoch was born on the day that they happened to observe Hag Shavuot. He also, the tradition they have from some ancient rabbinical writings is that Enoch was translated, or if I can say that use the term raptured, on that same day. In other words, he was translated on his birthday. What makes this provocative to me, Hag Shavuot is the Hebrew term for what we would call the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. That was when the church was born in Acts chapter 2. And I can't resist speculating or conjecturing. Is it possible that if Enoch is a type of the church, is it possible that the church also will be translated on its birthday? I don't know. Now, I don't want to set dates. Don't start doing that to me. But Because Jesus said, The day you think not, the Son of Man cometh. But if that's the day you think not, then that's maybe the day you'll come. Right? Okay. Stay away from date setters. We could, it's astonishing to make a chronicle of the people who have set dates way back in the 13th century on. And I won't go through all these. I mentioned John Napier was one of them back in the 17th century. And many others. William Whitson said it was, going, it was coming back in 1715. Then he decided it was 1734. Then he moved it out to 1866, which I'm sure was beyond his retirement age. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then uh, William Miller, 1843. Then he decided it was October 22nd, 1844. C.T. Russell, 1874. Remember E.E.C. Wisenant's 88 Reasons for 88. If you have any of those old books, save them. They'll be collector's items. Uh, Harold Camping, and it was sure it was September 1994. And of course, since we passed the year 2000, you can bet you know, all kinds of people are going to waltz out charts or formulas and whatever. And, and uh, uh, the date setters are always there. Let's just look what the scripture says. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew goes on, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour the Lord doth come. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You'd think that the point would be made, we don't set dates, right? 
We, times and seasons, sure, but not dates. We don't set dates.